to Fuel Your Drive. I'm your host, Josh York. And guys, today, I have to tell you, you know I always bring you fantastic guests. Today's guest, I have to tell you, I am so excited about it. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I couldn't really sleep much last night. And people like to always ask me, what keeps you up at night? And I always say nothing. But last night, I actually was thinking about this because I'm so excited. Guys, you're walking around in his shoes. You've seen his commercials. You've seen athletes that wear his shoes. Guys, I want to introduce you to the one, the only, Joe Foster, the founder of Reebok, and has got a great book out right now called Shoemaker. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. and Thank you for the welcome. That was great. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're going to love my energy, Joe. Joe, I have to tell you, I am like... I am just so honored to have you on on this show. You are you are an icon. You've built a four billion dollar business. You've you know, everyone knows the brand Reebok. And honestly, I, that's actually the shoe I prefer to wear. Just so you know, everybody, when I put on my jeans, which is very rarely because I like to wear shorts every day, regardless of the weather. But when I do put on my jeans, I love to wear Reeboks and I actually have about six pairs of them. So um, thank you for creating such a fantastic brand. And I, you know, I really want to use this episode because I, I don't want to take away too much from the book. Guys, you have to get the book. It's incredible. I have to tell you, so inspirational. But, but Joe, I want to get to like the real, like inside of the business and the challenges and struggles, because, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not at a billion yet. I will be, I'm working myself there, but I have to tell you, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, this 30, 40 years of hard work, and then you're an overnight success. So, you know, first, maybe, you know, first, let's kind of get into a little bit of, about yourself, a little introduction, and a little bit how you how you started Reebok. Oh, well, we have to go retro, really back <clears throat> a long way, probably go back to my grandfather, maybe even his grandfather, which is really, really, really going back. <laughs> My grandfather in 1895, 1895, he made for himself a pair of spike running shoes. And uh, some people think he invented the running shoe. He certainly was there at the beginning because he got the idea from his, his grandfather. His grandfather was a cobbler and he used to go visit grandfather because he fancied being a cobbler as well. He fancied that. But a cobbler repairs shoes. But not only did his grandfather repair shoes, three shoes, excuse <clears throat> me, he also repaired cricket boots. And cricket boots in those days had spikes in. And it's pretty obvious that granddad said to his granddad, why have you got spikes in the bottom of these uh, boots? To give them grip. Oh, light bulb moment for grandfather. Back home to his own little cobbling business and thought, I can, I can make a pair of running shoes because grandfather was a, a member of the local athletic club. He was sort of a midfield runner, not very good, but he made himself a pair of spikes. Uh, being a cobbler, he could do that, and he learned how to make the shoes by a turn shoe, good method. Don't use it today too much. Ballet shoes maybe, but not in today's productions. Uh, but uh, So he made these shoes. Next event he ran, he came second, a very unlikely second. And, of course, this really amazed his uh, teammates. Uh, Joe wasn't a big lad. Uh, <laughs> and not being a big lad, we just wonder whether his uh, teammates sort of said, come on, you've got to make us some shoes, or whether they asked him, please, Joe, can you make us some shoes? Whichever way it was, he did. <clears throat> so he was making shoes for his Bolton Athletics Club. And by 1900, he decided, this is a business. By that time, he was 20 years of age, and he had his own business. And uh, he started making his spike running shoes, training shoes, for all the local athletes. And he, he was pretty good. And this is something that Jeff and I, we set up, of course, with Reebok later on. And we were part of the family, the J.D. Foster family. But even when we started working for J.D. Foster, we didn't realize at that time how brilliant Granddad was. What a brilliant guy he was. What an influencer. By 1904, he had, um, he'd already supplied Alf Shrub with shoes, and Alf Shrub, whom nobody knows, actually brought three world records in 1904 at Ibrox Stadium, which is in Glasgow, in one race. And that was a one-hour race, and he also ran the farthest distance anybody had ever run in one hour. So that was the beginning of his uh, who's that? And then, of course, we come to the uh, second decade of uh, the 1900s, World War II, took them away, 
totally took them away from running shoes. In fact, they were repairing uh, army boots. And my, my father used to remember scrubbing the mud off the boots that came back from Flanders. And there was more uh, blood in that than there was mud. It was really sort of gruesome. However, 1920s come along, Joe's Belle Epoque. That was it. We have, we have a, a replica letterhead from that era. And he's listed on each side. My grandfather listed on each side the number of football, which are soccer clubs in America, the football clubs that he supplied with boots and training shoes. And you can hardly name one of the football clubs today in the premier divisions, the premier football clubs, Manchester United, Liverpool, Manchester City, all the big clubs he supplied. And during that, that, uh, the 1920s, he, he also supplied so many athletes with, with Olympic goals. And if you know, you remember the, uh, the film Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire immortalized three athletes. There were three British athletes. It was Eric Liddell, Harold Abrahams, and Lord Burley. They all won gold medals. And they all won those gold medals wearing my grandfather's shoes, Foster's. Foster's famous running shoes. So that was his period, however. He was to die young at the age of uh, 53. He, he died in 1933. I was born in 1935. But strange as that may seem, I was born on his birthday, the 18th of May. Oh, that's why wow. I became Joe as well. So I became, and that's because my, my grandmother, she was a real firebrand. And he's brought his name with him. My mother didn't particularly want me to be called Joe, but uh, I'm afraid she surrendered to grandma. So I became Joe, 935. Of course, four years later, we have World War II. So I didn't know much about that until the war comes along. So I'm brought up six years of, of, of World War II, blackouts, all sorts of things, looking at, uh, overlooking Manchester. Manchester was a big uh, industrial area in the UK and there were bombs dropping and we could see uh, the lights of the flames. So, and then by the time I'm 10, that's when war ended and probably had a normal you know, you're kids, you don't realise anything's different. That's, that's normal, you know, we're, we're always at war. What, what, what do you know? What's different? Okay, for the next uh, seven years, it's uh, education. And I did college. My brother didn't. He joined the, the Foster Company in 48. So in 1948, it was 1952 uh, before I joined. But I only had one year in the company, just making shoes, just starting to learn how to do that. When along came National Service. We had to, at that time, both Jeff and I, had to do national service two years. Okay, all of a sudden, you're taken away. Mother's no longer getting up, making your breakfast, washing your clothes, doing things for you. You know, what you used to do, your social event, all gone. Two years. Jeff went to Germany. What did he see in Germany? Adidas. What did he see? A different running shoe from what we've been making. <sighs> right. We come back. 1955. Back to the family company. And what did we see there? We saw a failing company. We'd been away, so coming back, it opened our eyes. And J.B. Foster's, probably the most famous uh, running shoe company, athletic shoe company in the world at that time. Not that many people knew of athletic companies. But fair, and they were still making shoes they'd been made in the 1930s. Jeff and I knocking on the door. Dad, Uncle Bill. Because by, by that time, uncle and father were running the business. But unfortunately, they were not running it together. They were fighting. They were feuding. They were falling out with each other. So we just had to try and say, look, if you're going to have this business, and we say to father, look, you know, we've got to change things. And all he would say in back was, look, when I'm gone and Bill's gone, this company's yours. And, you know, we say, well, look, Dad, the first thing is we don't want you to go. The second thing is the business will be gone by the time you are gone. And that can't happen. So 1958, Jeff and I had had enough. We'd, uh, we'd been to college in the evenings, learning more about, uh, about shoemaking. And in 19, 1958, we left and we set up our own company. Very, very nice. Very, very, very great story. Great story. So, you know, I know, you know, and I, I think let's, let's, let's keep picking up from where you are right now. So I know you love the letter R and let, maybe we could talk a little bit, but I don't want to give obviously a lot about, you know, in the way in the book, but 
So you got this dictionary. I mean, I'll let you tell the story. You got this dictionary and you thought R was a great, strong letter. So why don't you touch on that a little bit, a little bit, Joe? Well, what happened when we, when we left the company in 1948, 1958, we set up six miles down the road and uh, we, we set up as Mercury Sports for Mercury Sports for great, Mercury, fine. We've got the wing messenger, good name. And we started to do nicely we're making money our accountant said look you're making money you better you, you better register your name so uh, okay how do we do that go to the registrar you, you need an agent went to see the agent he checked up mercury can't have it well we could have it the guys who had it offered it to us for a thousand pounds and in those days a thousand pounds was like asking probably for 100 million today it was an absolutely incredible sum <clears throat> We said, well, if, if, you, if you can't buy it, you've got to set yourself up with a new name. He said, but we've got to test these with the register. So he said, bring me 10. We go back. We're, and we're looking through everything, uh, animal names, cheetah, whatever it is, bird names, falcon, lots of good names. But uh, in 1948, I was only eight. It was during the war, and I won a race, 60 yards, foot race. I won that prize. Prize was a dictionary. Okay, that's fine. But it was a Webster's Dictionary. Webster's. And most Americans know that's the American Dictionary. So why in the UK am I receiving, in England, am I receiving in the war a Webster's Dictionary? I don't know. But we all know that the spellings are slightly different in certain yep. ways from, from an English Dictionary. Yep. <clears throat> the English Dictionary is different. But, uh, okay, so we've got all these names, and I have this dictionary, and I'm thinking, let's have a look through. I love, like you say, I like that letter R. I thought that was a nice, strong beginning to any word. So I'm flipping through. Fortunately, R and E, the E comes pretty pretty soon down the list. Yep. And I remember, R, E, E, B, O, K. Rebound. Okay. A small South African gazelle. Gazelle. Wow. We all know a gazelle. Small South That sounds brilliant. Why don't, we, why don't we take that? Put this top of the list, take it back to the agent. He said, okay, we'll try these. He did come back. He came back about a week later and said, well, the only one that you've given me is, in fact, less letter R. And we said, thank God, because we've got to be in love with it. We've got to be in love with Reebok. It's something. It's our passion. Right. So we've got Reebok. Yeah, but the registrar will only put you in in the B category of the register. And we said, what does that mean, B category? Well, he said, if somebody comes to us and says, um, they're making shoes out of Reebok skin, Yes, we can't stop them. Oh, you know, we, we looked at that and thought, well, who's going to do that? So we didn't. However, 20 years later, the registrar came back and said, uh, well, we've moved you. You're not in part B anymore. You're into part A. And he said, because now everybody knows that Reebok is a shoe. It's not an animal. So that's, that's how we became, became Reebok. And that was two years after we started our business. That's amazing. So I, I want to dive deeper into the mind, right? Into your mindset, because I say business is 80% mindset, 20% tactical. And something I also like to say is obstacles aren't in the way. Obstacles are the way. So I also want to touch real quick before we talk about this, Joe, is that I know and believe for a fact that business it's build a business now is a lot easier than it was back then because you have technology, you have social media. It's a lot easier to connect with people. It's a lot easier to know, uh, you know, know things about people by just doing research through social media. Back then, I'm sure you were traveling all over the place. I'm sure, you know, it was, it was just very difficult. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about your mindset. Because I can't even imagine how many obstacles you have come into. I can't imagine how I, I, you might not even had the seatbelt on the roller coaster. It was all going all over the place. So let's talk a little bit about that because people don't understand what it takes to succeed in a successful business and how important it is to have the passion. You, you, right? you have to have passion. You have to love what you have to do and you have to have the right mindset. Well, I mean, I can agree with you totally that uh, being in business is a matter of problems. That's all it is. And, and it's, it's whether you see problems or whether you see answers, whether, whether yep. you see an opportunity, in fact. Yep. Uh, and we gave you one with the, with the name. The name, that was our first one. The second one is about four years. We've been in business four years. Yep. And I get a letter from Adidas. 
Adidas by them, big company, a real big company by comparison to Reebok. And um, our silhouette was two stripes and a T-bar. Of course, Adidas is three stripes. <clears throat> but their, uh, their attorney sort of said, well, you're, you're two stripes and a T-bar, we consider as an infringement of our three stripes. Oh, okay. So, Adidas, we were delighted. Fantastic. Adidas already noticed us. We, <laughs> we were causing us that. That was fantastic. <clears throat> changing, changing the stripes, well, we'll we're not going to fight these guys. Who needs to? So we change our silhouette. We changed our name. Why not change our silhouette? We can do that. Uh, you know, Jeff, at the beginning of this, Jeff was 25, I was 23. We're totally indestructible. You know, we, yeah, this is it. We're, we're going, going for it. So, uh, yeah, nothing's going to shake us. We're just going for it. We, we have a mission. So changing the silhouette. And so we, we end up with the, uh, the vector that we know today. That was a side stripe. So, you know, you know, is this good luck? Is it good bad? No, these are just, these are just opportunities. They, they, they change your mindset. They, they say, you know, we, we can change. We can do things different. So uh, well, then I'm going through life and we're saying, right, the big, the big business, what my grandfather had got into was soccer business. And that was big, but where we lost it probably was my uncle and father between them, not driving the company, just sort of uh, missed out on looking for opportunities or opportunities just passed by. So we, it was a bit too late as far as financially was concerned. We couldn't, we couldn't find our way in to the football business, but we were in the athletics business and we were well recognized and people liked us. But we're also in the UK and the UK is small. Foster's had had an agent, Yale University. They used to buy 200 pairs of their shoes every month, and Yale University was selling these around to other colleges and universities throughout the States. So I knew that was a bigger market. I knew that the universities, colleges had coach, and coach was God. Coach was somebody up there. You got a scholarship, and you, you're into a college or a university, and you've got the opportunity. That's a big market. For us, it's a big market. Opportunity came along in 1968. Uh, we were well into the business then and grown nicely in the UK. But the British government decided that they would like to give these sports companies a bit of help. And they wanted us to export. And they decided they would, they would pay for a stand at the NSGA show. That's the National Sporting Goods Association of America in Chicago. Uh, in February, by the way, in February, Chicago was cold, very cold. But in fact, they would pay for the, uh, the stand. They would pay for our return fare, And they'd also pay for half of our hotel bills. Well, didn't take much thinking about. So off I went. I went with a friend. And there were the NSGA show, February 1968. Brilliant. A lot of people loved the stand, loved the shoes. Where do I get your shoes from? Well, I said, England. And they look at me and say, that New England? Uh, no, no, not New England. England, across the water. Oh, that was the obstacle. Importation was the obstacle. Okay, what do I need? I need a distributor. I need to get my shoes available in the USA. 1979, 11 years. 11 years after that first visit, and 11 more visits plus a few in between, and I find myself a distributor, Paul Fireman. But how did I get there? Well, how many attempts? At least six failures. At least. I find gold short. People want to be a distributor. We try it. Um, I could name, well, in fact, I think in the book I named them all. But uh, they, these people tried. And for different reasons, they failed. But what was happening, and here's another great stroke of luck, is that uh, we were in running. And late 60s, Bob Anderson set up his Runner's World magazine. It was only a page at that time, but Runner's World and the magazine came at the same time that running absolutely exploded in America. Throughout the 70s, it grew and grew fantastically. And Runner's World as a magazine grew from this same simple black and white page into a glossy magazine with all the shoes in there. And I think Bob Anderson thought he could probably influence people, which he did. Uh, and he, he decided he would rate shoes. So they tested shoes and they rated them. Well, I mean, in America, the thing that running had grown so big that if you rated a shoe number one, everybody wanted that shoe. And you're almost saying a million people are going to place an order for your shoe. Well, 
I think this was probably Nike, Nike Tailwind, something like that. And of course, uh, Phil Knight, he's importing these from Japan. And I think it was the Tiger Company still on Suga, ASICs now, they were same, same people on Asuka. But they were, they were not easy. And then again, importing was not easy. So by the time he managed to satisfy or try to satisfy the retail demand for these shoes, we're talking about six, seven months down the road, maybe even eight months. By that time, everybody's thinking, what's next? And this is the problem. So the retailers have got masses of shoes at that time and sell, but all of a sudden it was going to change. This happened for two years, maybe even three years. And the retailers just got absolutely tired of it and said, Bob, don't do this anymore or change it. So Bob Anderson changed it to a star rating. So you could have a five-star shoe downwards. Five-star shoes were the best. But that means instead of being one shoe, there could be three, four. And that was the opportunity. I could see that. What I needed was a five-star shoe. Aztec. I designed Aztec specifically. We, we knew Bob Anderson. We knew what he was looking for. We followed the, the way that they were testing shoes. Aztec was designed to be five stars. And we tested this out in 1978 at the Empire. No, sorry, not the Empire. We didn't have an empire there. <laughs> it was the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. In the Commonwealth Games, Edmonton. Uh, it used to be Empire again, the Commonwealth Games. And uh, we had great success. We, we had the Aztec, which was a training shoe and road shoe. We had Midas because this was a gold range, with the Midas, which was a racing shoe, and we had Inca, and Inca was a spike track shoe. So we got three, three shoes, part of a gold range. And so in February, February of 79, I'm there again at the NSJ show, and not only did I see Paul Farmer, I had a visit from Kmart. Kmart, love your shoes, great idea, running is good, we, we'd like 25,000 pairs. Well, our factory could do that, take about six months for our factory <laughs> to do 25,000 versions. <laughs> but, you know, we knew we knew the demands. We, we were not sort of stupid. We, we knew that if we did get a five-star shoe and we, did, we designed the shoe to get five-star, we knew we needed help. So we'd sort of work with Barter, and Barter said they would help us. But then again, uh, came out and said, but we need a better price. And whilst... Whilst actually Barter could do a better price and we could do it at our own factory, they couldn't do the price that uh, was coming out of the Far East. So we were also working with, uh, with people from South Korea. And when Paul came to the stand, it, I think he got tired at that moment of the business he was in. He was in Boston camping. Boston camping was supplying fishing bits and pieces, tents, you know, anything to do with outdoor. And he said, Joe, he said, I'd love to be a distributor. He said, but really, we, we, do, we do need a five-star shoe. We need a hook. And we both realized that we needed that crack. And I said, Paul, this is the shoe. This is Aztec. This is the shoe. I'm sure this will get five stars. However, we've got to wait till August. Well, it was the last, last week in July when the magazine comes out. I'd been backwards and forwards and chatting to Paul, chatting to Kmart. And uh, it, it was on, I think it was just a week before I phoned Paul Feynman and I said, Paul, can you, can you get downtown, get, a, get to the local kiosk and see how we've done with Runner's World? It was a bit sort of, I think I, I think I got him up actually, probably only seven o'clock in the morning. So it was a bit dozy. An hour later, Paul came back and he said, Joe, Aztec, five stars. Wow. I knew that. That was it. That was brilliant. We, we'd actually got what we had. He said, but also, Inca five stars, Midas five stars. So we got five, three five star shoes. That was our Reebok really got into America. And that, I'm sure that's when it took off, right? So, you know, that's fantastic, by the way, Joe. Again, fantastic. So, so now you're in America. <laughs> You know, your revenue must have been jumping like out of control. Now, I always say teamwork makes the dream work. You, you know, you are nothing without your team. You have to surround yourself with great people and obviously bring on people who have, you know, better strengths than you and delegate those weaknesses to other people who are strong in those areas. So wh what was that like scaling your business? And I'm sure you've had some incredible jumps in revenue, you know, like how, how, well, that must have been that must have been very difficult. Well, running. I mean, that got us in, and we had some tremendous sales. You know, things started going well. It was a, a tech rep. Arnold Martinez was a tech rep down in L.A., and his wife coming home from uh, these classes, and uh, 
her and her girlfriend were just full of it. And Alan just said, Frankie, Frankie, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, it's this new aerobics classes. They're brilliant. He said, what is it? Well, he said, it's exercise to music. And we love it. <laughs> so I said, well, in that case, I'm coming down and having a look at what you're doing. Next time, he went down. And he's got the instructor there in a pair of running shoes. Half the class also in running shoes. The other half, no shoes at all. To Arthur, that was a light bulb moment. That was like, oh, why don't we make these girls a shoe specifically for it? Okay, so off he goes to see Paul Fireman. And Paul, Paul, this tremendous opportunity. What's happening down in Los Angeles? They've got these girls. It's a new thing. It's aerobics. They're doing all this exercise. Paul was not impressed. Paul said, I don't know. What are you doing? I mean, he's in Boston. You know, we're two sides of the country. Like, you no. Know, we're doing great, Arthur. We're running. Running, look, we're expanding. We've got this. We've got more orders that we could cope with. It's fantastic. You know, what do you, what do you want with these, uh, these girls? No, no, no. Let, let's concentrate on what we've got. Arthur wasn't put off, though. So Arnold just went around to the back door and had a word with the product people. And he persuaded them to get him 200 pairs of a nice, lightweight, cushioned glove leather upper just for this. Okay. Very shortly later, he got his 200 purse and he gave them out to the instructors roundabout. The rest is history. All of a sudden, the women just took to this shoe. They're not just wearing it for the aerobics, they were wearing it everywhere. You know, they put their heels in, in a bag and went to work in these nice, such, these shoes just took off. And they took off so much that a business which at that time was doing $9 million, very nice, rising nicely, became $30 million became $90 million, $300 million, and $900 million in successive years. And that, it just for the girls, they had, they had a shoe called Reebok, beautiful, nice. Adidas, Nike, what a day, male, sweaty. This is our shoe. So the women own this shoe. And that just drove the company. And I don't think the company were in control, in fact, Paul said to me, at least on one occasion, Joe, I know how to stop this because trying to keep up with this is incredible. I know how to stop this, he said, but if, if I do, I don't know how to start it again. <laughs> that, was, that was the problem. But financing had become a problem. But we managed to get through that, make an arrangement with uh, Stephen Rubin. He, he was a British uh, company and uh, he, he was a sourcing company. That's what they did. And, and he saw Reebok as an opportunity to source shoes for the big... Uh, big high street brands in, in America. So the finances were good. Because all he did was to give Paul a good, a credit line, really. And once you got a credit line, up it went. And Paul didn't care. He just, he just spent the money in, in building, building the business. But then it's not that. It's how do you, how do you get the shoes? I mean, you, know, you can get the money, but the product, somebody has to make the product. And that's, again, another stroke of luck. Because at that time... Nike, Nike had been doing tremendous, and then they hit this block. All of a sudden, Nike stuttered, and they were having to pull out of factories in, in, in South Korea. And the factories they pulled out of, we just were able to go in. So the opportunities to produce arrived just at the time when we needed it. So again, that's luck. Uh, the company, well, we, uh, we grew to just under $4, four billion, and uh, we became number one. We, we were more than Nike, bigger than Adidas, and as number one. And that was, uh, well, just before, I think it was 88, 89. But by, by that time, I got to the point where I thought it was time for me to leave. It, I, I was, uh, I, I'd built the rest of the international distribution. I'd put out about 30 different countries in less than 10 years, and we had a tremendous uh, global distribution. But all that was happening then is I was jumping on a plane, I was flying somewhere, uh, be picked up by a limousine, taken to the best hotel. We would then dine at the best restaurants and we'd be discussing a bit of business. But really, that wasn't for me. The, the challenge had gone by then because we had accountants, we had lawyers, we had people used to doing uh, grocery type sales in volumes. You weren't selling a shoe, you were selling boxes. And so by that time, I think it was good for me, and I, I thought, well, that's fine. I, I'm better off now if I just step back. So at the end of 1989, I stepped back, uh, and as it were, retired. But, you know, it's a bit like uh, uh, 
it's, it's a bit like the Eagles and Hotel California. You, know, you can check out, but you can never leave. Never leave. I was just going to actually ask you that next. You probably were so, so involved still because I'm sure they continued coming to you, asking you questions, getting advice, recommendations on certain things, right? They had to. Well, as they, as they still do. And one of the reasons for writing the book is the fact that so many people uh, have given stories, incorrect stories, as to how Reebok started, where yeah. it started, what happened. So the book tells the story. And you know now that sort of allows people to see where it did come from, how it did, and and, that, and that's good. So all these uh, nonsense stories now they have to do because this wasn't this wasn't the story of Joe Foster. This was always about Reebok. Reebok, and yeah. I, I, I wasn't the one. I didn't want people to say, "Oh, you know, Joe Foster's done that." No, that wasn't the idea. It was let's get Reebok as number one. If we can do that, we've done our business. So Reebok became number one. Um, I was able to step back. But like you say, people just kept on asking questions. And a lot of people said, why didn't you write your book? So it leaves me with one, I don't say there's only one thing left in life, but a major part of my life now is to have the uh, have the story, have the Shoemaker become a, a bestseller. You'll, you will 100% do that. Look, you really, I pay attention to everything. My awareness level is just through the roof, and I see that you're getting out there more and more. And you know, now that you're getting with all these other big people, you know, like you're going to just get in front of their audiences, and other people are going to reach out and reach out. And you know, your book's going to definitely become a bestseller. And again, guys, that's Shoemaker, fantastic book. You have to get it. So, Joe, um, you know, like I'm listening to you talk, and I could be wrong, but I, I just. You know, I, I know sales is very important. I'm very good at sales. I don't think you have to be very good at sales, but you strike me more as a marketing person. Now, don't answer yet, but you have to be able to market to obviously get in front of people. You don't, I, I believe you don't necessarily have to be the salesperson depending on what business you're in, but you have to be able to build that omnipresence. And you come across to me more as that person who's able to just get it out there and, and be that marketing person. But I could be wrong, but are you more of a marketing person or more of a salesperson? Well, you know, when we started off in business, the word marketing didn't even exist. Marketing was just another word for sales. The French, but well, isn't that selling marketing? Isn't that just sales? <clears throat> but you're right. I'm a lousy salesman. I, really? I, well, I'm not a salesman at all. I I knew. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that. I, I would just think <laughs> you're. Str- you, you come across to me stronger as a stronger marketer. Um, but I, I, you know, you could say you're a lousy salesman. I, I would disagree because obviously, you know, you, you still have to present yourself and and be able to close deals. So you you have that ability. But I do think you need a stronger ability to market because if you can't, you know, build awareness and get it out there you're never going to be able to sell it anyway. Well, I, I, would, I would put a salesman, a man who can look at product, take it in and whatever it is, and then go out and you'd be able to sell it because the first thing he has to do is to sell himself. You've got to sell yourself. If you yes. can do that, you're a problem. I could sell shoes. I could sell my product because I knew my product inside and I knew every other product. I could compare it against anybody's product. So I could tell, I could tell the story. But that to me is not a salesman. A salesman is born. A salesman has that genius inside that comes yep. out and that happens. A marketer doesn't have that because a marketer absorbs what's needed. Yep. A marketer absorbs the market and then channels things as against selling the channels and, and makes the opportunity for the salesman. And that is more my area. It's a matter of saying, well, why don't we put it this way? Why don't we do it that way? Why, you know, how can we open those doors so that people can go in and sell? And it is, it's finding the book. It's opening the door. Not actually being the person who walks through, but it's opening the door. Opening it. the opportunities. So 100%. marketing is me. 100, listen, I agree with you 100%. I, you know, it, the, the, the key is, you know, you, you have to be able to have that ability to build relationships. Everything comes back to people. And when people like other people, you will be able to open those doors. And that's how you obviously are able to market and and open those doors. But, you know, let's, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are are like really like craving for some, some real good advice. You know, like I always tell people, you know, you better get used to getting those. You better get, you better get used to rejection. You better get used to that roller coaster effect. You know, what do you tell people, you know, like what advice would you give to someone who's trying to start a business? Cause look, I start my, I started my business and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jim guys, it's our personal training company. 
I know you're from the UK. We just opened there actually. Um, and next time I'm there, I know you go back and forth between France, I believe, and and the UK a lot. But uh, when I am in the over the lows, <laughs> yeah. Well, when I am in the UK and all this passes, I love and be honored to take you out to dinner, Joe. My treat, obviously. You know, so we got to connect after after this podcast to talk about that. But <laughs> but um but you know I always say entrepreneurship is like a game. And, you know, you have to be able to almost look at like challenges and issues like it's not real and money almost like it's water because you're going to lose a lot of it. You're going to make a ton of mistakes. So what advice would you give someone who's starting out? Because I started my business bootstrapped. I, I, I literally had no money. I didn't come from money. And today we're the largest personal training company in the world. And you grew the, 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 the largest f- f- foot, f- you know, footwear company in the world, sneaker company. So what advice would you give someone? Well, like you, we started with nothing. I mean, I, that, that's where you start from. And I used to go out and I, we're talking about selling. And I used to go out. And I would call on these retailers and uh, try and sell them my product. And I told the product, great, yes, wonderful. And um, that's great. And say, who's Reebok? Oh, I'd have to give him the story of who Reebok, where we came from. And then he would usually turn around, or off quite a few of these, turn around, point to his shelves and say, look, I've got ideas. I've got Dunlop. Why do we need Reebok? Now, that was the important question. That I heard that a few times. And that, to me, is listen. So if you have a business, you need to listen. And people will ask you a question. Why do I need Reebok? And so why am I? I don't keep on beating my head against these doors going in there, doing the same thing. I've got to make them want Reebok. Yep. So when they say... Why? So this, this to me is the difference in, in anything. Listen, find out how you can make that difference to your business. Okay, you can make a difference by making a different product, whatever it is, but you do have to make a difference. And for me, it was the fact that I realized in those early days, I'm trying to sell run issues through the business, through the trade, through the retail stores, which is normal. But my, my customer was the athlete. So I had to get to the athlete. Yep. And so the first thing I had to do was to change where I was going and go to the athlete. And we were very lucky in the UK. We had the three A's handbook. The three A's handbook listed every club in the country. And it, it had the name and address of every secretary. So I was able to go direct to my athlete. So it really, the advice to me is, who's your customer? Who really is your customer? Yep. And when you find your customer, what we found out, we went direct. We gave them a small discount. But then the retail business kept telephoning me and said, you're selling direct. And I said, I'm selling shoes because you wouldn't sell. Well, we'll stop your shoes if you'll stop selling direct. And I said, no, I won't stop selling direct, but I will sell to you at wholesale and consider our selling direct as promotion, as advertising, something that makes people interested. Because in those days, not many people wanted uh, to buy online. More people wanted to go into a store and try it on. So what we were doing is we were creating a desire. And if if the retailer was willing to do that, 90% of the retailers accepted that. And so that for us was a form of marketing. And so the thing is, when we say, what do you, listen, find out your customer, make sure you're not just making a product, that you're making something people want. And uh, if they want it, you will sell it. That's fantastic. I love that. So, you know, talking about athletes, I'm sure it was very different than compared to now. What was it like actually getting an athlete? Because I'm sure, you know, now you probably got to pay millions of dollars to do endorsement deals. Like, what was it like back then getting athletes and, and was it expensive? Well, in those days, no. I mean, if we're going back to the 60s, 70s, and this is way during the 70s, no, an athlete was very happy if he received a pair of shoes. Wow. That's so, <laughs> that's so different, so different now. Yeah. I mean, whilst it's so different now, it's just a different way of marketing. Yes. Uh, people used to come to me, uh, quite large companies come to me and say, you know, we don't like this idea of giving or paying for athletes and shoes. We, we'd rather give them value. And, and I said, well, you can give them value, but you're not going to sell shoes off value. You, you know, 
People are not influenced by that. Some are. You know, you'll get something. If you look on the lower end, the lower prices, you'll sell, you'll sell product. People these days, they, they, you know, they want something to live up to. They want something to, to see. Influences, that's where it is, that people influence. And, and I know they, <clears throat> this company had a big, compa- uh, big ca- campaign at the VFM. They just called it VFM, value for money. And they spent a ton of money on value for money. Failed. Failed miserably, and uh, and I, you know, the guy used to talk to me all the time and say, "Well, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money because people don't understand value for money. They would understand Cristiano Ronaldo. They would understand a, a top athlete they, 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 because that's what they watch. It's spectator sport. It's opportunities to see the brand, and the brand is not it is not value for money." The brand is whatever you're putting on that shoe, and it's that association. And you know, there's nothing new. Let's just go back, right back to my grandfather, who supplied Alf Shrub with his shoe to break three world records. Yeah. Who looked at that? The other athletes looked at that. That's incredible. Now, yep. now the sports business now is fashion. Sports business is performance. And everybody loses performance. We're doing less and less, like you were saying, setting up a business now, you can have a computer. We didn't have computers. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have all that. Now, you, you've got all this. But you, you need then to have people look at, we're spending more time doing sport, doing everything. Uh, we have so much pleasure time, so much free time. So it's what influences you to buy the product now. And so that changes, but the idea doesn't change. The idea is still the same. The idea is who would who would you like to uh, be like? You know, if if so and so, if this person Ronaldo can score so many goals in that boot, surely we should buy one of those boots. And nothing's changed. Yeah, that's nothing's that's changed. very true. That is a hundred percent correct. Hundred percent correct. Wow. Well, listen. Two last questions, Joe. This has been fantastic. Well, what would you say your proudest moment? You know, at Reebok was you know the one thing that just stands out over everything else. I think the proudest moment was actually breaking into the American market with a five star shoe. I, I think that was it. I think there was. We, we didn't just dream of it. We realized it. We recognized it. We we actually went for it. We had purpose. And, and when we got it, we got there. Another proud moment is when you're number one. But that becomes, that, that's, I don't say that comes by accident, that comes in process. Yes. We had, we had to deliver. We had to deliver the hook. We, and that is something that you've got to be proud of. And, you know, one, one of my saddest moments of, the, of that is we just delivered that, just got that hook, but my brother unfortunately became ill and died. And he didn't share. They, he didn't share where we went to, but that was probably an added spur to me to make it happen. But uh, so you know, you've got all this the the sadness, the happiness, the big things, you know, the small things, and a lot of small things that happen are so big. My my friend John Willie Johnson, you've read the book. I wanted to buy a machine. He wouldn't let me buy his machine. He said, "No, you can have it. Give it me back when you're finished." He knew we couldn't afford to buy the machines. Yeah. So he knew that. And all the time along, he did that. And it's those small things, just when nobody knows, you're only a small company, but it's, it's those things that really, really make you understand that, you know, to be an entrepreneur, to be in business, you've got to relate to people at whatever level, every level, whatever, you've got to relate to people. Yes. And, You've got to understand them. And one of the things that uh, John Willie Johnson taught me is that I went to his factory because we were going off to buy some products or go to a sale to buy a product. And he said, Joe, come along to the factory. We'll go together. You come along and I'll drive and whatever. You'd see my car, so he didn't want me to drive. <laughs> but we went to his factory. We started at the top and we worked all the way down. And every person he met, he knew their name. And he asked them about the family and how it was so important. So smart. Yeah. He had that personal sort of contact. And that, that, did, that was so, so incredible. I, I, I never had that ability, but I envied it. And I knew that you've got to, you've got to treat people as humans. They're, they're equals. Everybody's doing, everybody's doing part of what your business is. When you've got 10 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people, they've all got to feel part. And if they can feel part, 
and valued. Very yeah. true. Listen, it's value. Yeah. Very true. This is so important. It's very true. Everyone, I talk about this all the time. It's called emotional intelligence. You have to understand people. You have to understand people. You have to treat people right. You know, I actually, Joe, I cringe when people call me the boss. I don't like that at all. It makes me, I actually correct them right away. I, they like to call me the fearless leader and I'm fine with that, but... I feel like boss. I feel like employee. I feel like they're just degrading terms, you know, because you got to make everyone feel part of it and you're doing it together. And it's very important. So great, great words, great words. Well, the last question I like to always ask on, on my show is if you were conducting this interview, Joe, what question would you have asked? What question would I ask? Uh, have you enjoyed it? Have you enjoyed what you've been doing? So, and I, I already know the answer, but go ahead and answer it, please. Well, you have to, because again, when people say, "What well, are the most important things in running a business?" It's fun, fun, and fun. If you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying it, you will not give value. So, pleasure, having fun, being able to smile, even at the worst of things, being able to turn it around and say, "Didn't we do well?" Yeah. And if you've not got that feeling that you, know, you get up in the morning and today is going to be a good day. Every day is good. They don't. All, they don't all turn out good. <laughs> but you got to. If they're not, you got to try and turn them around. Main thing is you get up with the right feelings. It'll be a good day. Get up with the wrong feelings. It'll certainly not be a good day. So true, Joe. You know why I love doing this podcast? I love to obviously you know, give, you know, my listeners great content, but it's also very validating for me, you know, in many ways. So I run my business and it's also my book. It's called Fuel. And I literally have a gas tank. I have a gas tank that sits in the middle of my headquarters. And the first word of fuel represents fun. The second represents unity. The third one re represents earnings. And the last one represents leadership. And I always say those are the four pillars of success. And everything you have said today has literally just validated with my beliefs and, and what I'm doing within my organization. And um, I just want to say thank you because it also makes me feel really good to hear someone at your caliper of the success you've had to just validate things I'm doing. So listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I know that, you know, you can follow Joe, uh, you're on Instagram. It's uh, Reebok, the founder, correct? Yes, indeed. We're on Instagram where we're on all the social media. And uh, if you want to get the book, you can get the book from Amazon and any leading bookshop. Yes, guys, pick up the book, Shoemaker. I'm telling you, it's inspirational. It's fantastic. Check that out and follow Joe. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, I'm your host, Josh York. And don't forget to always fuel your drive. Legend.